Hi, everybody. Wow, I didn't know it was such a big room. There's so much energy and innovation here and practical-minded good work in bringing these ideas into the, into the real world. Before we dive into some more, does anybody need to stretch? I know you have a big morning session. Take a stretch if you need to. Um, please stand up. <laughs> How many are from Marin County? Any Marin people? Yay! My mom drove me over here this morning from um, her house up in San Rafael. And how many from other parts of the world? <laughs> it's just such a fabulous um, mix of people. And for me, it's a huge honor and a huge pleasure to have the chance to get together. And um, take your time making your, your way to your seat again. <laughs> um, what I'd like to do is open up in a conversation on our shared mission. Somehow, you know, harmonizing people and nature. And um, what I'd like to share is some new work um, in one dimension of this. Obviously, there are many, many different dimensions to achieving the transformation that, that we're all pursuing. But um, what I'd like to get into is this question of um, curing the brain damage. And it's funny to talk about this. I have wires all around my head <laughs> so people can hear me. But <laughs> Hopefully, they're sending good, uh, good vibes. <laughs> um, so anyway, when we think about the world, just to kind of set things up in a pretty stark way, in the foreground, we see a tea plantation. And then in the background, we see a, a cloud forest in Uganda that, that does all kinds of things. But we know, and in, you know, in terms of this brain damage and the systems error of not accounting for the value of natural capital, the contrast couldn't be starker than in a place like this, where in the foreground, you know, we see people working. Those people know the, the value of their work. They at least know what they're going to be paid for working in that ecosystem. The people who package up and market the tea all over the world, they know what the value of that ecosystem is to their business. You know, the government officials who sort of regulate and tax the system, they also know what the value of the system in the foreground is. But who knows what the value of that system in the background is? You know, who's working it? Who's um, thinking about the distribution of its benefits for helping to stabilize climate all around the world? What governments are thinking about investing in and sustaining the system in the background that supplies so much, you know, in, in terms of water to local people and then much further downstream to the capital cities? the biodiversity that's sort of Earth's genetic library. There's so many benefits that I know you could all speak very eloquently about, but that we don't ever capture in our decision making, or very rarely do. How do we begin to do that? <clears throat> the idea of beginning to do that is sort of taken hold in many different realms. This is a cover from 2005. But bringing the ideas down to practical use is, is really the huge challenge today. And then. Being able to move from um, you know, local successes to replicating and you know, adapting and scaling up to be meaningful in terms of achieving this harmony, that's our, our big challenge. So what I'm going to do is dive in, mainly tell you some stories, but they go around this little funny molecule-like diagram. Um, so we're mostly concerned with decisions at the top, right? That's what we want to change. So let's keep that in focus as our main goal, is to change decisions. But we want to know how decisions affect ecosystems, natural capital, living systems that um, are the stock, whether we're talking about forests or wetlands or grasslands or coral reefs or any biome on, on the planet. They're <clears throat> the stock of sort of the machinery of life, of our life support systems that supply a stream of services to society. And these have value for human well-being in many different ways. I don't mean only dollar value. I mean value and making life worthwhile and stuff like that. So, um, but how do we transmit that value into different types of institutions to change our decisions to um, create different sorts of incentives, rules of the game, things like that? So that's kind of what we're going to be working around. But I'm going to tell stories. And just before diving into the stories of moving from that theoretical framework to real change, just get us all on the same page. So Kenny was talking about the 
different types of um, services that we have. And one easy way to think about them is in four categories. There's production of goods that we all depend on and consume every day. Um, seafood, crops and livestock, forest products, shown here in, in Hawaii mostly. Um, we also can think about basic life support services. Um, the many things that, like, an, imagine that instead of um, ending today's morning session and having a nice lunch, you were to go out into the big parking arena and blast off to the moon. You know, and what would you bring with you? Say you were going to make a one-way trip to make life up there um, possible and hopefully worthwhile over the rest of your life. And you could persuade a few friends to come along with you. But what would you bring with you? Obviously, we'd want to bring goods. And you might have a pretty long list of, of goods that you consume every day, your favorite breakfast and dinner and stuff. But there are all kinds of underlying life support services that we'd want to be thinking about in going to the moon. And in many ways, going into the future is becoming like going to the moon because um, you know, it's, I don't want to give a depressing talk, but there is this depressing fact that we're expected to lose about 50% of the other life forms with which we share the planet in our own kind of 100-year period that we're, you know, we're on watch. <laughs> so 50%, we're kissing goodbye. And the question is, well, if we've got limited resources, limited ability to mobilize societies to invest in some of it, how do we focus those investments? At least to um, hopefully sustain what we've, what we've got pretty well. So these are the basic kinds of services we'd want to think about in heading up to the moon or heading into the future. And then obviously on the life fulfilling side, you could get a lot more eloquent than we have up here, but just in terms of categories and getting our minds on the same page, there are all these inspirational, benefits, knowledge systems, sense of place, recreation, you know, tranquility that we seek from nature. And then finally, in all of this, we obviously need to remember all the time, and I know we do, to be humble. It's, you know, we're just scratching the surface of the connections between human beings and uh, the biosphere, and what the heck we're all doing here anyway for the little span we get. Um, so preserving options and recognizing that we only know a little bit of what we ideally know in taking these really huge decisions. So getting back, and I'm going to dive into the first story now. We're going to work our way around. The first story touches on where those two yellow arrows go. And the, the basic point of it is to say we've got to get way beyond the idea of saving nature or saving um, our life support systems on the scale required in reserves. There's no way we're going to protect enough in reserves. Even though we've got about 12% of the land surface globally protected, there's no way that would be enough to supply all those life support services on the scale required. But we have a good option, and I'm going to dive into two neat examples that I always find fun, um, where the work is new, looking at pollination and pest control. There's no way that we could get like pollination in California expecting bees to fly out from Yellowstone or, or Yosemite or whatever. We can all get that, right? We need to have the conservation integrated with production systems. And it's be taking um, or capturing a lot of attention now because honeybees are in decline worldwide. If you follow the news at all, you'll know all about that. <clears throat> the big question is, can wild native bees do the job, you know, from habitats like in the oak woodlands around here um, that fly into parts of, um, say, in Yolo County, just east of here, where there's a lot of organic farming, people depending on those wild bees. And what are the people doing conventional production in more of the Central Valley going to do in California. So I'm just going to give you a couple examples, and we're going to focus on coffee. And I hope you guys all had tea or coffee um, to keep you going this morning. But <clears throat> there's a bee pollinating a coffee flower in that middle picture. And here we are out in Costa Rica um, asking whether this nearby rainforest will supply enough bees to pollinate the coffee and whether that'll um, make that rainforest somewhat more valuable to the farmers, right? Mostly where you see coffee growing today, you know, people have cut down rainforest. But is rainforest actually an input to coffee production? So here's the coffee. These are the little white flowers. And then nine months later, you get these beautiful red berries and, and the harvest. And does ha having a bit of rainforest way in the background there, this stuff, these are eucalyptus trees in a so-called shade coffee plantation. But um, in the background, you have real rainforest. And what we wanted to do 
This is an old air photo, so it's blurry. Don't worry, we'll get to a clearer slide in a minute. But here are the bits of rainforest, and then there's this, this enormous farm that is over 1,000 hectares in area. And um, the little bits of rainforest are only about 50 and 100 hectares in area. There are two of them. And we wondered whether the bees you know, fly out a little bit and give a yield boost and an income boost to the farmers a little distance away from the forest. And so we set up these experiments different distances out, going out 1.6 kilometers from the edge of the forest. And this is what we found. Well, first of all, I should say, we nearly went blind and became crippled. We had no idea how many bees were going to be out there. In California, they're about, in the most diverse places, you'll get about 75, which is a lot, different bee species flying around, pollinating farms out you know, in, near Davis and stuff like that, especially where there's more native habitat. Here, um, we had about 700 different types of bee. And you tell them apart under the microscope by looking at, you know how um, TV commercials used to always make you worried about split ends? <laughs> um, their hairs split at the end, and how they split is one way that you tell different bee species apart. And so anyway, there's 700 different types out there, all with split ends, that luckily the <laughs> businesses haven't started marketing <laughs> shampoo toward, but um, <laughs> the, they're all out there doing the pollination, and we got 20% higher yields in this little halo around the forest. So within some, you know, within like half a mile of the forest, you get a yield boost, some hundreds of meters. And that yield boost um, translated into an income boost of 60,000 US dollars to that one farm in one year. So it's huge, and it's something completely unaccounted for. Um, in another study that's going on now, I, I love sort of boasting about the work of students. And so that first study was led by a student, Taylor Ricketts, who then became head of science at World Wildlife Fund. This one's led by two students um, who are still in school. But we're working with um, these different coffee farms. And this one happens to be Rainforest Alliance certified. And they're worried because this new pest has made it to the new world called the coffee berry borer, and it drills into coffee beans and eats them from the inside out. And there's no pesticide that's effective against it. There's basically been no way to control it, and it's causing hundreds of millions of dollars in damages and ruining livelihoods worldwide. And coffee, by the way, it's the biggest export from the developing world most years. Sometimes oil um, beats it out, but it's a huge industry, you know, we see one end of it here, but a lot of millions of livelihoods depend on coffee production. So what we're doing is looking at the 170 bird species and 70 different bat species that we think might be helping to control the pest out in the coffee. And so we're catching them. This is at night, catching the bats, um, giving them a little refreshing drink <laughs> before we send them out again. And um, and then here's a weird thing, but this is what biologists study. So we collect their poop in these little bags. They, they usually um, you know, leave little droppings. And then we've got these. And with that, we check, we bring it all back, clearing you know, US customs somehow, and run it in a lab. <laughs> and um, you can see with these new techniques, you know, in the DNA, you can tell whether the pest is in there. So we can tell what's being eaten. Um, you know, which of all these bird and bat species on these really nice coffee farms um, where there's no nature reserve, but they still manage to sustain all these birds and bats because of a good integration of production and conservation. We can see what they're consuming. And, and then on top of that, we have all these experiments out on different farms with these most wonderful people um, letting us use their land. Some little cages are set up right by a bit, a bit of rainforest, and others are really far from rainforest. Here's what a cage looks like up front, and we're trying to measure what the benefit of being close to rainforest is, because there's more birds and bats close to the rainforest. And so far, this is work in progress, we've found that birds and bats together reduce pest damage by 50%. So it's a pretty massive benefit that also is unaccounted for. So I just wanted to give you, that's the first story, and I just wanted to give you a taste of what biologists get to do. And um, now what I want to do is lift from here, from this, these sort of micro details of coffee and birds and bats and bees, and lift up and say, well, how the heck do we bring this kind of perspective and understanding to our decisions, remembering that sort of molecule diagram? 
Um, and what we're going to do is talk about this part. Is there some way we can start systematically accounting for these values? So this group got together called the Natural Capital Project. And what we wanted to do was, there are many, many institutions that are part of it. We wanted to do three things. Package up the latest science. And much of the science is a lot more developed than what I've just told you. That's kind of the new frontier. But like in water and climate, in um, the many other things that Kenny announced at the beginning, you know, coastal protection from storms and inundation, all these areas, there is a lot of science and understanding. And we want to use that science in a, to inform decisions in sites and sectors, a lot of different economic sectors around the world, and then engage leaders to magnify the impact of these hopefully successful demonstrations. So there are these four institutions at the top that kind of do the paperwork, but there are dozens of other institutions leading the effort in individual places. We're working in about 30 countries. And one of the tools we bring is called INVEST. I'm just going to show you quickly about it. Being based down in Silicon Valley, of course, we had to come up with a software tool. But it's um, for integrated, you know, of all these different types of services, valuation of these ecosystem services and trade-offs. And I'll just show you how it works. The idea is to run scenarios. So it could be more at a big regional or global level, asking how climate change or population change or new policies would affect the provision of these benefits to society. It could also be at a, um, you know, we often work in more local to regional scales, like here in the Central Valley where we've cleared most of the native vegetation, we could say, well, what if we increased by tenfold the um, little riparian corridor along that river? What would that mean for income, for farmers, for drinking water quality, erosion control, carbon sequestration, biodiversity? And how do we think about these options we might have? Another is, you know, along the coast, how do we look at the, the um, merits of investing in coastal restoration? in order to protect nursery habitats and improve the fishing industry and income, control erosion and flooding, that kind of thing. So you see, there are just all these different choices we face and trade-offs, but how do we make nature not have just a big zero next to it in the calculations? So with the software, we've got all these models. We started putting them together a few years ago, and um, it's taking time. Most of them are together now. They're free and downloadable, and I'll give you the website in a minute. Um, and they're in all these different areas. On the left in green, they're terrestrial land-based models. You're looking across a landscape. You can play around with maps, and I'll show you maps in a minute, and ask how would things change under different scenarios. And on the right, you have the more aquatic and marine models. Um, and what you do, basically, and we're linked up with Google, you're, you get all the data that Google's now amassing on, on natural capital, just basic stuff like land use, soil type. Um, topography, you know, things like, um, um, what was I going to, you know, precipitation and temperature, all that kind of stuff goes into the model. You also want to know about built capital, you know, where are the people and what do they want and <laughs> how is demand going to change over the coming 20 years or whatever your horizon is. And then you put that together and you get outputs of ecosystem service levels that could be, you know, provided and likely to be demanded under different scenarios. So here's where you can download it, I just at this naturalcapitalproject.org website. Right now it requires that you use ArcGIS, which is a really widely used geographic information system in the US. But globally it's not as widely used and it's kind of expensive. So we're, by early in 2013, we're gonna have a, a new platform where this is all available for free. Um, you won't need to work through ArcGIS. But anyway, this is what we have now. If you're interested in the, in the real nitty-gritty mathematical details, they're in this book here that came out last year. And what I'm going to do now is just dive into a couple of examples of how this can be used. So this is a third part, sort of moving beyond charity as a major you know, force in um, conservation, not to let go of it, but to say we need to make conservation part of all our decisions and activities. So this third part of the the little framework. So like I said, we're working in about 30 countries, loosely circled up here. I'm going to dive into three places where some of the most pioneering work is going on. The first is closer to home in the US, in Hawaii. 
where, you know, just to set the stage, over 95% of the forest has been cleared in Hawaii, the native forest. Most of what you see in the low-lying areas is not at all native. Um, so there's a lot of interest in using invest in land use planning and especially in trying to restore forest for the many benefits it supplies. And we started out working with Kamehameha Schools. It's the biggest trust in the U.S. and they are the biggest private landowner in Hawaii. And um, they own all those land assets shown here. There, there's a long, really fascinating story to, to do with Kamehameha Schools. Basically, the last princess in the Kamehameha line um, inherited all this land as her relatives were dying, as Westerners were moving in and taking control of the islands. And um, she put it into this trust. And there's, there's much more we could say about it, but I'll just move quickly. Um, so those land holdings in blue, remember a lot of the, especially the new islands, are lava. Those are really iconic, beautiful, rich land holdings. And yet a bunch of them have been developed in ways mainly to maximize revenue to fund these schools that she established to try and um, let Native Hawaiians compete in that phase of globalization as Westerners were first moving in. And um, now they've come to regret that. There have been a lot of, there's been a lot of backlash in the Native Hawaiian community. And around the year 2000, they actually sacked the board of Kamehameha Schools. And they put in people who said, OK, we're going to take a new approach. Instead of you know, just maximizing revenue at any cost, <laughs> we're going to try and balance these five things here that not, you know, we're not idiots. We're obviously going to look at economic value, but also environmental, cultural, educational, and community values. So how do you mix all these things in thinking about using land assets? And in a way, when Chicago and LA lawyers are breathing over your shoulder, um, checking that you're meeting fiduciary responsibilities of the trust. So they, they picked this iconic holding of it's about 27,000 acres on the north shore of Oahu and, and teamed up with us. And we looked at different scenarios for the future. So that's what it looks like kind of on the ground here. This is a Google Earth image. Here you've got a closer up look with some photos. And here the land has all been classified according to use. You've got to classify it. But um, you see that there's some of the last undeveloped coastline, these rich agricultural fields. And Hawaii has something like a People argue over whether it's a three-day food supply or a seven-day food supply at any moment, you know, as if three to seven days is really going to matter. So the food security issues are huge there. Energy security is a big deal. Um, in the upland areas, they've got really nice native forests that they lease out to the military um, for low-intensity maneuvers. So they get, they've been getting some income, but they're struggling. They're in the red on this land since sugar went out of production. This is the old sugar lands. They still have good irrigation. They have a lot of cultural assets, like this fish pond that was built hundreds of years ago, really sophisticated aquaculture um, system. So what do you do looking into the future? How do you integrate those five categories of value and making a plan and um, winning people from the community into your vision and, and plan? Uh, that was the question. So over a two to three year you know, time, line, we um, had a lot of meetings with people, developed a whole range of different scenarios, had a lot of wonderful geeks on the left and the bottom doing modeling as to what the implications would be. It was early on that we came up with these three to, to, uh, that the community came up with, right? We just kind of processed the input. Sugarcane as a biofuel feedstock to help address the energy security issues. Another was housing. Native Hawaiians especially, the, a lot of um, inequity in housing and things. And so there was interest not in a Waikiki big development, but low density housing. And a third was food crops for local markets and koa restoration. And koa, this native tree, is very high valued timber species. So we ran these different models. And the output is always in the form of maps. And I know you can't see this, so I'm going to move. But I just want you to see that these maps in red, you have a decrease in green and expected increase in value over this was a 20-year planning horizon. So these arrows kind of show you the upshot. And it was early on. We only had a few models developed at that point of this work. But we have um, the three scenarios here. And then you can see whether you're expecting a decrease or an increase and what the implications for income would be. And they actually chose this scenario of diversified agriculture and forestry 
because it met their balance of goals best, along with some other cultural values that we didn't throw into the computer system, but um, looked at very systematically. So even though it has the lowest projected income stream, almost hurt, unheard of in, in the US context, you know, they're saying, okay, this is the path we're gonna take. And they developed this big plan, they won an award from the, the American Planning Association for this work a year ago, and um, are developing a whole plan with restoration and with um, sustainable agriculture as the core. So that's an example in the US, and it's meant to be, hopefully, you know, an example that we could try and replicate. Um, that's kind of a question for us. Please wrap up. So I'll go one more minute, <laughs> um, and then I'm pow. Um, so in, uh, I just want to show you two other places that are doing really neat work. The first is in Latin America, where there are these water funds, where people who consume water, whether hydropower companies, big irrigators, or cities, pay upstream people to shift to more sustainable practices and restore watersheds to secure water supplies. These are just taking off, and they're using Invest all across Latin America. They're, they're gonna be about 40 funds within the next three years. Right now, they're about 12. And now, a big bottling company for Coca-Cola, FEMSA, is underwriting some of these to just seed them so that there's some payout in the near term. I hear some hissing. There's also, you're gonna hiss more, the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank are also behind it. And my feeling on the hissing is unless we get these big, you know, movers and forces in the world behind this, we're not gonna get anywhere beyond little tiny successes. Okay, well good. <laughs> um, and then, so these are just taking off like wildfire. The other um, place in the world, China, um, it's incredible. I'm just going to show you one picture. They've decided to put 25% of land area in a new kind of reserve that is meant to achieve this balance between securing natural capital and improving livelihoods. 25%. And this is, these are the lands that have been delineated, and they're using Invest as the official tool for China across you know, the national government. And yeah, it's just been breathtaking. And it's, it's astounding to see the people leading this um, in China, the Chinese Academy of Sciences report directly to the premier and um, are embarking on just a huge experiment, <laughs> basically. And I was gonna show you the devastating effects of not doing this, deforestation causing massive flooding in China. That's what's motivated a lot of it. And then in closing, I just wanna leave you with this little quote from Confucius, that there are three paths to wisdom. The first is through contemplation, and that's the noblest, what we're all here to do and share. The second is through imitation, and that's the easiest. We all hope people will imitate these models of success. And the third is through experience, and that's the bitterest. And we hope, knowing in our own lives this is true, and we hope globally we can bring ourselves together. And I thank you again for this wonderful chance.